All right, good morning, everybody. Hope you had a good weekend. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started today. So in these lectures, I'm going to focus on primarily the Alex problems, the problems that are in your homework assignments, just to kind of give you some tips on doing those problems, okay? Um, as it says in the syllabus, Alex is essentially- Good morning, professor. Good morning. It's like 94% of your grades. So the Alex is, of course, the main component of grading and scoring and all of that stuff. So, so that's why I'm gonna focus on those primarily. Um, Alex, the, the way we've set it up is the topics that are covered are essentially the same topics that are in your textbook. So you can always refer to the ebook or the textbook for some background on how to do some of the simpler problems. Um, sometimes the Alex explanations, when you pick on the explanation, it's not that good. Some of the, I mean, some of them are decent explanations, some are not. So um, you can definitely um, access the ebook for a different kind of take on um, how to do these problems. But you're going to do these problems. You're going to have you know, of course, it's very rapid. We're only doing this in six weeks and we don't really have, there's no, like sometimes there's a couple holidays that are thrown in there. So you kind of get seven weeks, but um, looking at the schedule, it looks like we just have six weeks to do this stuff. So it's very rapid. So that first homework assignment, which under Alex, they call it inspected, is chapter three. And um, there's like 22 topics in there. So you got to do a lot of topics this first week. Luckily, the topics are the same ones that are covered in Chemistry 100, the previous course, the prerequisites. So, so it shouldn't be completely new to you. Um, and then after chapter three, it's a little fewer topics. They go down to below 20 for the most part. So it gets a, a little fewer topics, OK? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to um, start talking about some of these homework problems. And then, um, by the way, always feel free to reach out to me by texting. In particular, texting is really good. As I said on the syllabus, um, I have Telegram, Signal, WhatsApp, and texting. So if you have a quick question to shoot to me, you can always reach me that way. If I don't get back to you immediately, it's just because I'm either sleeping or I'm busy. Okay, But I'll get back to you eventually. Um, cool. So let's go ahead and start. So chapter three is the first, uh, what do we do? Chapter three, four, five, six, eight, ten, and then nine is extra credit, but I will cover nine as well. So what is that? Seven, there's seven chapters we're going to do. Okay. So the idea here is in chapter three, this is kind of historical chemistry, which is in the day in and day out, activities of a chemist or a biochemist or a molecular biologist, we're weighing things. We're always weighing things. And the reason we weigh things is because by weighing things, you can actually figure out how much stuff you have. So when you buy drugs, whether they be over the counter or through prescription um, or on the street, they are generally sold in mass units, typically grams or milligrams or micrograms. So um, on an industrial scale, you might deal with kilograms or megagrams. So we're gonna be dealing with mass units here, okay? So it all starts with this idea that we have elements, right? In the periodic table. And, and I recommend, you know, print out a copy of the periodic table it's going to have all that kind of important information that you need for this. And in the periodic table, they're going to give you information that's important, right? So they're going to tell you the names of the elements like hydrogen. And then they're going to give you the atomic masses. And those atomic masses are what we're going to deal with in chapter three. You know, almost all, almost I think every problem in chapter three involves these masses, right? So um, we're gonna use it a lot. And then we'll kind of get away from it a little bit and then we'll come back to it and we'll get away and we just go back and forth. But um, the atomic masses are important. So those are essentially how much these elements weigh, right? So hydrogen is the lightest element. It has an atomic mass of 1.01. .01. And then you get you know all the way over on the other side of the periodic table, 
element two, which is helium. And this is like four, 4.00, right? So helium, you know, on average, helium weighs four times as much as hydrogen. It's four times heavier, right? Or hydrogen is four times lighter. And then you get to the third element, which is right underneath uh, hydrogen, sorry. And then you got your lithium, right? And this one weighs more, right? It's 6.94. So it weighs more than helium, but not twice as much. It weighs a little bit more, like 50% more, yeah, about 60% more. And then you get your next element, which is number four, which is beryllium. And beryllium is what, like 8.01 or something? 8. It's 8.01, something like that, okay. And then you come over to the other side of the table and you get boron, which is 10.81. And then you get carbon, which is 11.01. And then you get your nitrogen, which is 14.01, oxygen, and that's 16.00, right? So, you know, no need to memorize those numbers. You just want to be able to find these elements in the periodic table so that you can do all of your calculations, okay? Um, these particular elements right here, these three right here, and this one up here, these are important elements. You're going to be doing a lot of problems in Alex that are using those specific elements, right? Those four. And, and if you take a guess, maybe why those elements are important, you know, for those of you that have taken biology courses, you know the answer to that, right? Which is that life is comprised of, you know, roughly 20 elements. And most of, most of our mass is due to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. If you look at the number of atoms in the body, it's mostly hydrogen. But if you look at the mass, it's primarily carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Of course, there's also calcium and, and iron and phosphorus. Those are the other elements as well. But those are the, you know, those are the important elements. So you'll find that when you go through these problems in Alex, you're going to get carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen coming up quite a bit. Okay. So that's just how much they weigh. Just be careful, you know, we're going to have different units. So what are the units? Okay. And this is where you be careful because, you know, there's two different ways of looking at this. If you're dealing with the mass of one atom, we typically use what's called the atomic mass. And the units are called atomic mass units. So that's like how much one atom weighs. So for example, if you're looking at hydrogen, we would say that the mass of one hydrogen atom is 1.01 .01 atomic mass units, AMU, okay? But if you're dealing with a large number of atoms, a huge number of atoms. And when I say a large number, I mean like the same number of stars that are known in the universe. If you have that many atoms, then we use a different unit, right? So for example, if you were going to say, how much does a 747 weigh, or, you know, an airliner, you wouldn't put the units in ounces or pounds. You would put it probably in tons. The same is true if you're you're dealing with atoms. If you're dealing with one atom, you're going to use a different unit than if you're dealing a large number of atoms. So the typical unit is when you have this many atoms, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. If you have that very large number of atoms, then we call it the molar mass. And the units are grams per mole, grams divided by mole, okay? We'll talk more about that when we get to section 3.4, either today or tomorrow or Wednesday, right? So for example, for hydrogen, we would say that if you have this many atoms, the molar mass is 1.01 G for grams divided by moles, M-O-L. And we'll abbreviate mole with M-O-L. We'll take the E off, okay? So this you're going to use more often. This is the one we use most of the time. 
And we'll see why that's the case when we get to the later sections in the chapter. But just keep in mind, when you do these problems, sometimes when Alex is, you know, if you read their explanations, sometimes they'll be using the term atomic mass and they'll be using the units atomic mass units and the abbreviation is AMU. Sometimes as you go through these problems, it's gonna be in the molar mass and the units are gonna be grams per mole. And then the unit, you know, the number would be here 1.01 grams per mole, okay? So the first type of problem that I'm gonna show you is called a percent composition by mass. And that one actually uses the atomic mass. And you could do the problem using molar mass, but typically textbooks will use the atomic mass. So we'll use that name, um, which means you're just counting the number of atoms, okay? So let me show you an example. This is one right out of Alex. It probably, unless you've taken, if you took Chem 100, you may just know how to do this and you got through it. So, you know, it won't even come up for you. But if it comes up for you, um, you know, I'll show you now how to do it. Okay. So this is called finding the mass percent. So I'm going to abbreviate it. As, you know, I'll just use the percentage sign um, from the chemical formulae. Okay, and what they do is they give you the chemical formulae. I'm sorry, they give you the chemical formula. So they just give you this chemical formula and then they ask you to calculate the mass percent of one of the elements. They tell you to do it for hydrogen. And then I'm gonna actually put this down because sometimes this comes up, they say round it round to the nearest percentage, okay? So you're gonna find, if you haven't used Alex before, that it is pretty unforgiving in terms of rounding. It's gonna want you to give the answer, you know, essentially exactly the way that, that, that it wants, the way that it calculates the answer to be. So you have to be very, you know, that's where you're like sort of, if you're obsessive compulsive, you'll probably have an advantage in this because you tend to do that anyways. But um, but if, you, if, if you're used to sort of just, oh, it's about like this or it's about like that, that's not gonna fly with Alex. It's gonna, it's gonna tag you on that one. So you'll get frustrated. So, so try to be patient and follow the rules in terms of rounding, okay? So, um, so what, you know, this is section 3.2, right? So, cause we're doing chapter three. And um, chapter, you know, that section really just has one type of problem that this really is this right here. So, so what are we doing when we do this mass percent? What are we doing? Essentially, it would be, this is an analogy. Essentially, it's an analogy. It'd be sort of like saying this, suppose you have this object, you know, some finished good. And let's say that this object is made out of plastic. It's made out of metals. And it's made out of wood. All right. So who knows? You know, it's hard to find an object that has all three of those ingredients these days. Most things are made out of plastic or metal or wood, but not all three. I guess if you bought like an, you know, like a, a bookshelf, it might have little pieces of metal to hold the shelves up. It might have nails. It actually probably has plastic too, because if you think about it, when the when you buy these things now, there's some glue in there and glue is really a plastic. So it would have all three. So essentially what you're doing is you're saying, look, how much of the total weight is due to one of these ingredients? So suppose I said, hey, you know, the plastic weighs five pounds. I'll use imperial units, pounds. Um, if you're used to metric units, I'm sorry, I'll just use for this one, Imperial. Um, let's say out of metal, it's like, you know, 25 pounds, right? And then out of wood, let's say it's just to make it easy, 10 pounds. So whatever this object is, it's made out of three different materials 
some plastic, some metal, some wood. Essentially what you might wanna ask is how much of the total weight is due to plastic, okay? So we would call that percent plastic. And it would be the weight of the plastic divided by the total weight times 100%, right? Percentage, right? So you multiply by 100, right? And, you know, leaving aside why we might want to do this, it's a pretty simple calculation, right? You would just take the weight of the plastic, which is five pounds, and you would divide that by the total weight, which is what? 25, 30, 40 pounds. And then you would multiply that by 100%. So what is that? One eighth, so that's 12.5%. And then what does it do? It says round to the nearest percentage. So I guess we would round that to 13%, okay? So that's essentially what you're doing in these percent mass problems of chemical formula. You're taking the weight or the mass, technically it's mass, not weight, and you're dividing of, of a particular element. And then you're dividing that by the total mass. And then you're multiplying that by 100. And there are many reasons why we do this in chemistry. One of which is that if you actually have that information, if you can calculate it, it can give you some pretty good clue to what the substance is. So if you have, you know, some of you, actually, I don't know, I, I, don't, I think there's one major in, in this class in your section that's a forensic science major. Um, and so if, if you're doing forensic science, you might want to know like what the substance is that you find coming out of someone's mouth, I guess. And so you don't know what it is. So you do these sorts of analyses. So one of the analyses you would do is a percent composition analysis. You know, that, that's one. There's other tests. There's chemical tests you would do. But, but sometimes it's important for us to know. The, the other thing is that sometimes when you make things that are complicated, like chemicals, a test to determine whether you made it in the right way is to actually figure out how much, like how much sulfur does it have? Does it have the right amount of sulfur in it? Does it have the right amount of phosphorus in it? And if it doesn't, if that test comes up as is too little or too much, you throw the batch out, right? Or nitrogen, for example. Um, so, so sometimes we want to know what these percentages are. Okay. So once once you get that idea, it's a pretty simple calculation. It's just a matter of the sort of details of the symbols. So let's go back and look at this from a chemical perspective now. So instead of plastic, oops. So instead of plastic, I'm just going to erase this. I'm just going to make a little room for us down here. Instead of plastic, wood, and metal, we're now going to do carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay. But the calculation is essentially the same. You just have to know what the molar masses are or the atomic masses. So in the Alex homework, they, they ask you to use the atomic mass. So that's fine. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to find the percent hydrogen. It asks for hydrogen. So percent H. So here's how you would do it. You would take the mass of the hydrogen, and you would divide that by the total mass. And then you would multiply that by 100% right? Just like we did with the plastic, five pounds over 40 pounds times 100%. Same idea. The difference here is just the terminology. The terminology is different. It's not just like the weight of something. We have this like atomic mass, molar mass, molecular mass, formula mass. There's a bunch of different names that are used to really kind of get at the same point. And you know you can spend hours talking about whether we should call it one thing or another, but it's essentially the mass of something divided by the mass, the total mass, okay? So here's how you go about it from a practical perspective. The element you're looking at is hydrogen, right? We wanna know it for hydrogen. So I'm gonna circle hydrogen. Hydrogen appears in the formula right here. Now the trick is each hydrogen has a mass, right? 1.01, that's the number that I gave you earlier, right? From the periodic table. But how many hydrogens are there, right? Because each hydrogen has a mass, but if there's more than one hydrogen, 
the mass of the hydrogen is going to be heavier, right? The mass of two people is not the same as the mass of one person. The mass of two wheels is not the same as the mass of one wheel. So the first step is to count how many hydrogens there are. And if you look at the way we do this in chemistry, sometimes we have these parentheses, right? And those parentheses are used to tell us that anything that appears inside the parentheses, it's going to be scaled up by the number that comes after it, the subscript. So that two means there's two of everything that's in the parentheses, okay? So in the parentheses, we have three hydrogens, but then we have two after the parentheses. So that means there's two of the three hydrogens. Well, if you have three and there's two of the threes, you have six, right? So it's really the mass of six hydrogens. And then the total mass would be six hydrogens plus how many carbons? Well, there's a C, so that's one. And then there's a two outside the parentheses. So two times one is two. So there's two carbons. And then there's another carbon here. Oh my goodness, there's another carbon, right? There's another carbon, so one carbon. And then there's two oxygens, okay? And then you're gonna multiply that by 100, okay? So you got to you got to count the number of atoms properly. Let me actually show you what this molecule looks like in terms of its structure. You're not expected to know how to do this yet, but later in the course you'll learn how to do this. Um CO2 CH32. Okay. Really? Yeah. CH3 CH3 and actually, you know what? I'm actually wrong about this. These get kind of complicated. Okay. That's actually what the structure of the molecule looks like. And if you go on the later in the course, you'll learn how to do what are called Lewis dot structures. And it looks something like this. Okay. This is called methyl acetate. And methyl acetate has a smell to it. You would be able to smell it. It's probably produced by certain fruits and vegetables that are fermenting and get this kind of compound. Out. But you wouldn't be expected to know that. But that's essentially what we're saying. We're saying, look, there's two CH3s. So you see there's a CH3 there and another CH3 there. So there's two carbons and six hydrogens, right? And then you've got a CO2. Well, there's your CO2 right there, right? So if you count things up, you get three carbons, you get two oxygens, and you get six hydrogens. So, but you want to be able to do it from this formula, right? You don't need to do it from here or down here because we're not doing that yet in this course. We're doing this here. So the two times the carbon, so that's two carbons, plus another carbon here, that's three carbons. Three times two is six hydrogens, and then two oxygens, and there you go, okay? Once you go from that to what I have on the right, then you can just go to your periodic table and start adding things up, right? So the periodic table here is, is essential. So let me write the three elements down. So there's your hydrogen. There's your carbon. And there's your oxygen. All right, those are the numbers you want to use, the 1.01, 12.01, and 16.00. Now, let me make a point about periodic tables. Depending on which table you're using, the numbers might be slightly different, right? So you may have noticed in a previous course that sometimes oxygen is represented as 9994, 15.9994. And that's perfectly fine. If you want to use that number, you can, okay? This one you might see is 12.0107. Absolutely fine. This one you might see is 
nine four, I think it is, right? So depending on which table you use, you may have different, slightly different numbers. But generally what happens in this problem is it says rounded to the nearest percent. So it shouldn't make a big difference. If you find that Alex says, no, you're off a little bit because we used a different value of you know, these masses, what I would recommend doing is just use the pop-up periodic table that Alex provides. So when you go through that initial tutorial, it shows you how to access the periodic table on Alex, use their table. And then that problem will go away. That way you're using the actually the same numbers that they're using, okay? So just be careful about that. So let's go through the arithmetic here. So you got six hydrogens. So six times 1.01, .01. the units that they use are AMU, the atomic mass units. Then we're gonna divide that by the total mass. So I'm gonna combine these, right? If you have two plus one, that's three carbons. So six hydrogens, six times 1.01, .01. three carbons, and then two oxygens. And then times 100%, okay? So percent hydrogen is the mass of the hydrogen divided by the total mass times 100. It's probably gonna be relatively small percentage because hydrogen is so light, but let's take a look. 6 times 1.01 .01 divided by 6 times 1.01 .01 plus 3 times 12.01 .01 plus 2 times 16. And you multiply by 100. Don't forget that part. And what I get is a little over 8%. I get 8.179%. But they say to round it to the nearest percent. So is this closer to 8 or is it closer to 9? 8.1, well, that's closer to eight than it is to nine. So it's 8%. So that's the amount of hydrogen in there, 8%. Only 8% of the mass is hydrogen. A much higher percentage is gonna be the carbon and a much higher percentage is gonna be the oxygen, okay? So there you go. Do you have any questions on this particular one? Because, you know, I'll be honest with you, when you take, when, when I teach this course, different people are at different places at the beginning, right? So you may have taken Chem 100 as recent as a week ago, and you may be really good at this, and you know how to do percent composition without even thinking about it. But sometimes people get in here and they haven't even taken Chem 100. So if you have any questions about that, um, now would be the time to ask. And um, if I don't get any questions, I'll just move on to the next one. Okay, no questions. So I will assume that um, that makes sense to you. Okay. So um, let me just check real quick and see if there's any, I'm gonna show another problem and see if there's anything that comes up that's significantly different that you would need to think about. And um, I don't see, they're, they're all pretty much the same. They give you these little organic molecules. Um, I think what I will do just before I move on to the next topic is I'm just going to show you one of them where they give you the chemical formula and then I'm just going to count the number of atoms and set it up. I won't go through the whole calculation, but I'll take a look. So in one of them, they give you CA3, PO42. So I just wanted to show you counting up the atoms, you know, because sometimes that's the difficult thing for people. Okay, so your first element is CA, so that's calcium. Remember, elements have either one letter or two, and the if, if they have a second letter, the second letter is lowercase, right? So like, that's carbon, and that's calcium, right? So the second letter next to it is lowercase, so that tells you that it's the same element, right? The A goes with the C. 
So if you saw something like CO, if they're both uppercase, you know, and these are, that means you got carbon and oxygen, right? But if you have CO and one's uppercase and the other one's lowercase, since that's lowercase, that means it's the same element. And it's just only one element there, right? So be careful as you look through these symbols, right? Like if, 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 if one of them is lowercase, that means it's the same, it's referring to the same thing in that cobalt, okay? So it's calcium, right? So we have three calciums, right? I'm just counting them up. The subscript refers to how many there are. And then you've got a phosphorus in here and there's only one, right? There's one phosphorus, but then you got your parentheses. So it's one times two. So you got two phosphorus. And then you got your four oxygens here, but again, they're in the parentheses. So that's times two. So you got eight oxygens, right? So really then your percent, let's say you wanted to do calcium, you know, it'd be three times the mass of calcium. So calcium is 40.08. And then down on the bottom, the total would be calcium, phosphorus, and oxygen. So three times 40.08. Plus how many phosphorus did we side two? Two times 30.97. I'm running out of room here, so let me erase this. And then how many oxygens you got? You got eight, so eight times 16. And then times 100, right? So if you were doing percent calcium, you just take the calcium, three times 40.08 divided by the total. Sometimes I recommend like just calculate the total separately. Just do it separately on your calculator. Estimate if your answer makes sense, right? You know, three times 40 is 120, right? Two times 30 is 60. Eight times 16. Well, what's eight times 16? Oh, well, I don't know actually, but you could probably estimate it, right? 16 times two is 32 times another two is 64, times another two is 128, right? And then just add those up in your head, right? Like this is 180, this is 128. And then you get, you know, that's like what, 308? So then when you put it in your calculator, see if you get something near 308. If you get 305, if you get 307, if you get 310, you probably got the right answer for that denominator. But if you get like 500 and that's way different than 308, then you it's a way to check yourself. You know, you made a mistake in one of those two ways. But if you get, you know, oh yeah, they came out pretty much the same, then that's some evidence that you did the calculation right. And then that makes it easier. Then you can say, look, three times 40 over 308, well, you know, that's 120 over 308, right? So, you know, count by 120s, 120, 240, 360. If it was a half, that'd be 120 over 240. If it was a third, that'd be 120 over 360. So a third is 0 0.33, uh, a half is 0 0.5. So that tells you your answer is gonna be between a third and a half, 33, 0.33 and 0.5. And then you multiply it by 100 and you can do all these little estimates along the way that are helpful for you, okay? In any case, that's essentially the idea, okay? And really it comes down to elemental analysis. The idea is if we can find these percentages, they can give us some clues on what the substance is. They can confirm that we made the right compound. You know, caffeine has a different chemical formula than cocaine. And so if you have a substance and you do a percent carbon on it, you're gonna get a different answer. And so that allows you to identify stuff. Identifying is something that some chemists do. Confirming that you have the right amount. That's something that chemists do. It's also something that biochemists do, right? And molecular biologists do it to some extent as well. Okay. Physicists, engineers, engineers do it too. Uh, engineers will do elemental analysis in terms of metals. It's pretty common as well. Metallurgy it's called. All right. So that's um, section 3.2. There's really only one type of problem from that. Then you get into the next section, which is 
balancing chemical equations. So section 3.3 is chemical equations. Oh, by the way, you know, if you're interested, if it comes up and you want like a little more, a little more lecture on a particular topic, um, all of my spring lectures are still available on YouTube. So if you just um, go on to my YouTube's uh, page or what do we call it, page or whatever it's called, um, you know, all of these topics that I'm covering here today and for the next six weeks. Sometimes I might have to rush through a couple of topics or several topics just because we have so limited time. Um, you can always refer back to the previous semester, spring 2021, chemistry 1100. It's in the same folder in there. And all my lectures are there too. And, and when each, each lecture it tells you what topics we're covering. So if you go to the beginning, you can watch another lecture of me doing this thing. And I don't always do it exactly the same way. I kind of tend, I'm doing this really pretty spontaneously. I just sort of look through the problems you have to do and I lecture on them. So each semester will be a little bit different and my explanations might be a little bit different. And so um, you can always refer back to those. Um, and then of course, also the sample, pro I put that in the syllabus, the sample problems from the textbook, some of the Alex book problems, they're all, you know, I've, I've made videos for those over the last year. So they're all there. So you've got, you know, if you, if you want to spend 200 hours watching my videos, you can do that. Um, but the main thing is try, you know, start practicing on these and don't, don't feel bad about getting the wrong answer the first time you do. That's what's going to happen sometimes. Okay. So chemical equations. So the first thing they have you do in the Alex problems for chemical equations is really what I was just doing right there in the previous problem, which is counting the number of atoms, right? So um, in a way, um, probably that, should have been a little earlier. This, this stoichiometric coefficients should have been a little earlier. But let me show you one, because I didn't actually, I don't think I even went through this with the students last year. I generally don't do it, but it actually is what I was just talking about. So stoichiometric coefficients, that's the first type of problem they have you do. Okay, so I'm gonna pick one here. This one's actually got a lot in it, right? So it, this one's an interesting one. They, they give you this formula here. And if you get confused over the way the chemical formula, it doesn't seem consistent, don't worry about that. That's how chemists are. Chemists have different ways of representing the same information. And um, that can be confusing. It takes a while to kind of get, oh, that they're doing it that way instead of another way. Okay, there we go. So in this one, they ask you to count the number of oxygen atoms. Now they're gonna ask you to count them on one side, I think. They say to do it on the left side. But I'm going to do it on both sides just to show you, right? Because you've probably heard of this idea of balancing chemical equations if you haven't even done, you know, you've probably even done it before. So, so let's go through it. So we're just going to do the oxygen here. So they say do it on the left side. So let's do it on the left side. And then I'll do it all the way over on the right side too, just to show it. It should be the same. They balance this equation, so it should be the same number. Okay. So oxygen, well, the first substance on the left, there's just one oxygen here, right? It's just that O right there. That's the only one there. If there's no subscript, it's just one, right? If there were two, it would have a two underneath it. Um, so it looks like there's just one oxygen there. So one, and then you have this over here. Now you do have a subscript, that's a two, but you've got a coefficient, which is 12. So 12 times two. So keep in mind when you have, that number in the front is called a coefficient. The number at the back of it, the back end, which is written below, is called a subscript. That's what we call it, subscript, okay? And so you take the coefficient and you multiply it by the subscript. So that's 24. 
Okay, so one plus 12 times two is 25. So there's 25 oxygen atoms on the left side. Now let's do the right side. You've got a two here, and then you got an eight. So coefficient times the subscript, so that's 16. And then you got nine, and the coefficient is a nine. Sorry, the coefficient's a nine. Subscript, there's nothing there, so that means it's a one. If there's no subscript, it's a one, not a zero, right? If it was a zero, it wouldn't be in the equation at all. So, you know, like in, in a, in an algebraic equation, you wouldn't write 0x plus y. 0x means nothing, so it's not in the equation, right? Um, so 9 times 1. Well, 16 plus 9 is 25. So see how it's the same number? When it's the same, that means it's balanced, right? Like a, like a seesaw. If you have the same mass, on both sides, and the fulcrum is right in the center, and the density of the plank, the density of the lever is the same all the way through, um, then it's gonna be balanced, right? So what would happen is, if I didn't have this nine here, then what you'd have is eight times two, which is just 16, and it would be unbalanced, right? You know, now you'd have 25 oxygens over here, and you would only have 16 over here. It's unbalanced, right? So that leads us into this whole issue of, of chemical equations, which is that we want to balance chemical equations so that they're the same on both sides. And the reason we really do that is because of nature. Nature has a particular rule that we would observe, which is called the law of conservation of mass which says that matter is neither created nor destroyed. Now, maybe matter was created at the beginning of the universe in the Big Bang, and maybe it'll be destroyed at the end of the universe in the deep freeze, who knows? There are processes where matter is destroyed, but it's not really destroyed, it's converted into energy. It's just converted into something else. So, so even a black hole doesn't really destroy, it transforms things. It turns matter into energy, okay? And it turns out energy and mass are interconvertible. So an atomic bomb, what does that do? It takes elements, uranium specifically, or plutonium, which are what we call matter, has mass, has volume, mass and volume, converts some of that mass into energy pure energy, right? And if you can, con it turns out like a little bit of mass, if you convert it into energy, it's a lot of energy, right? So like a chemical explosion is actually a conversion of matter into energy, but the mass change is so small. It's, it, it, I don't think anybody even to this day has figured out how to measure the mass change. It's such a small percentage change in mass to produce energy in chemical reaction so little mass changes, you can't even really measure it. I, I'm not gonna claim you can never measure it because people do amazing measurements, but as far as I know, it hasn't been measured yet. For a nuclear explosion, an atomic bomb or a hydrogen bomb, um, a plutonium bomb, any of those sorts of devices, the mass change is big enough that it's measurable and it produces a lot of energy, <laughs> a lot of energy, right? Um, in a star, most stars, what they're doing is they're converting hydrogen, our, let's take our sun, for example. It's converting hydrogen, the simplest element, right? Into the next simplest element or the next more complicated, which is helium. So it's taking hydrogen atoms, fusing them together to form helium atoms. But it turns out the helium atom weighs a little bit less then the hydrogen atoms, it goes through a pretty complicated process. So it actually ends up taking four hydrogens to make one helium. But when, they're when it goes through this relatively complicated process, you get a helium atom that weighs a little bit less than the four hydrogen atoms. And that mass change is converted into energy. 
And that energy radiates its way from the center of the sun. I think it takes a long time for it to get there. I think it takes like a, a, a at least a few seconds for it to, to radiate out. But eventually it radiates out and that's what heats up the earth. And that's what heats up the solar system, right? Is that radiation is being produced by converting, you know, those four hydrogen atoms into one helium atom with a slight, it's like a really small percentage. It's like, I think it's like 0.1%, like only 0.1% of the mass is converted. And that results in an enormous amount of energy that, you know, allows the sun to, you know, provide the heat for the entire solar system, or at least for the for the Earth, anyways. Okay, all right. So, um, in chemical reactions, there is a slight change in mass, but we can completely neglect it because it is such a small percentage um, that it, we don't even we can't even really measure it. So that means the mass on the reactant side is effectively equal to the mass on the product side. So if you're digesting food. Right, so you're eating a sandwich, or you're eating some hummus. That food is going to get converted. Chemical reactions are going to occur. Some of that chemical reactivity leads to energy production, heat. Your, you know, cellular processes are able to kind of harness some of that heat to convert it into chemical energy, or they harness the chemical energy. They don't harness the heat. They harness the chemical energy. Um, but there's really no change in mass, right? So like all the carbon dioxide that you exhale, if you add up all the mass of the food and the mass of everything involved, there's really no mass change if you were to collect everything. Okay, that's the conservation of mass. So we're reflecting that in this chemical equation. The mass over here at the beginning, think of this like a, you know, like a, a factory, right? That's really what a chemical reaction is. It's, a, it's an atomic factory. All these atoms are combining with each other, rearranging to form these new substances. And so the amount of materials that goes into the factory has got to be equal to the amount of materials that are coming out of the factory. Okay. You know, all the boxes going into the Amazon warehouse are equal to the boxes coming out of the Amazon warehouse. That's essentially what's happening. Okay. It's kind of cool. All right. So that's the first type of problem there. The second one is then they have you start, hey, let's get into balancing. Let's start actually doing some balancing of equations. And so the first type are with what they call not, this is balancing. And, you know, they're going to use some uh, terminology, which, you know, I don't know how, how useful it is. I think this is really for the instructor. Non-interfering coefficients means it's easier. When you get the ones that are called interfering coefficients, they're harder, okay? Now, I've probably just biased you right there and made it more difficult for you to do the ones with interfering, but that's fine. So for this one, it's a short enough equation. I'm gonna write the states of matter. Remind yourself that you have these ideas of states of matter, right? And we like to put that in there too, just so that we understand what's happening. S is solid, so that means that first material is a solid. G is a gas, so that means that second substance is a gas. So this is what we call the hetero, you don't need to know this first course, heterogeneous reaction, meaning that you have a solid substance reacting with a gas, which is actually what happens in clouds. So there's all this chemistry that happens in clouds where gas molecules are reacting on ice crystals. So a cloud, typically the ones that are up high, they actually have little crystals. The ones that are lower down typically have water droplets. That's what a cloud is, is a bunch of water droplets that are going in between, the water's going back and forth between being a gas and a liquid. But you know, a cloud, you have to have liquid water to have a cloud. So it's kind of cool that they float, right? You got liquid floating. Um, but it's a combination of it. But also in these clouds, you have little crystals, little solid crystals of uh, like ice. And what happens is, you know, gases can react on the surface of these ice crystals, right? And so it's a surface chemistry. So we call that heterogeneous, like 
something that's a gas is reacting with something that's a solid. And the solid, not only is it reactive, it acts as a support, right? It acts as like a support for the reaction to occur. Because gas molecules, it's actually hard for them to react. Gas molecules are moving like little, like little balls real fast. And so they often just miss each other. But if you have a surface, things can react on the surface. They get stuck there. And then something else can come on, you know, hop around. And they actually do hop around on surfaces. So if you have a car that's, you know, not electric, it has what's called a catalytic converter. And catalytic converters just have these metal surfaces where the gas molecules can kind of stick to them and react on the surface. And that's called a heterogeneous reaction because one of the reactants is a solid and the other one is gas, okay? So this says that a solid is reacting with a gas to form a solid. And really what they do they, in these problems, they say is just balance it, just balance the equation, okay? So here's how I'm gonna do it. We're gonna, I'm gonna use a technique called inspection. There are approximately 45 different methods for balancing chemical equations. The most common one is called uh, inspection, which means just sort of look at it and figure it out. You're not really using, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to give you a little bit of structure to it, but essentially you're just counting things, right? Because you know, like if I said, hey, here's a bunch of dimes and here's a bunch of pennies, I want you to sort them so that you have the same value on both sides, you would know, oh, I've got three dimes, so I need 30 pennies, right? You, that's called inspection, okay? Now, let's go through it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start on the left side. Usually what I do is start on the left, but you can start on the right side if you if you wanna read right to left. Okay, someone's coming in. There we go. So I'm gonna start with the first element I see, which is sodium, and I'm gonna count them. Now, there's no subscript and there's no coefficient, right? You're balancing, so your goal is to put the, the uh, coefficients. Never change the subscripts, just change the coefficients. The, Nature will change the subscripts. And we don't have really control over that. But you can change the amount of substance you put in. And that's what the that's what the coefficient is. It's the amount that you're putting in. So the subscript tells you what it is. You can't change what it is. A tree is a tree. A tree is not a car. But you can change how many trees you have. You can grow more trees. That's the coefficient. The number of them is the coefficient, okay? So you can change the numbers in the front. Okay, so I'll put little lines there just to indicate that's where we're gonna change. So there's one sodium, but there's two over here. So what you can do is you can change the coefficient. So I'm gonna put a two over there. Now we have two on both sides. So notice the number, the total number, is the coefficient times the subscript. So two times one is two. You can change the coefficient, but you can't change the subscript. So if I have two in the subscript, I'm going to put a two in the coefficient. Now they're equal, right? So you, again, you can't change the subscript, but you can change the coefficient. So sodium is done. Um, now we do oxygen. How many oxygens on here? There's two here and there's two there. So it's done. It's two. They're both two. No need to change anything. So I'm not going to write a coefficient here, but there is one there, right? You understand there is a coefficient there. It's just we're not going to write it. The coefficient is really a one. But in chemistry, that means one oxygen. That means two oxygens. That means two oxygens that means four oxygen. So when we don't write any numbers, it's a one. So one times two is two. But chemists don't do that. They never put a one in front. Alex will mark you wrong if you put a one. So what you do is you just leave it blank. Okay. So that's balancing a chemical equation with non-interfering coefficients. It's pretty easy. When they get interfering, it's a little more difficult. And sometimes you have to be a little more structured and more organized in terms of how you solve it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to the ones where you have interfering coefficients. That's the next type of problem. Okay. Again, let me just remind you, if you do have any questions about these problems that I'm doing, um, 
feel free to ask a question. You can even put it in the chat if you want to. That's fine if you want to do it that way. Either way, it's fine. Um, let's take a look. Otherwise, I just keep talking, and I will. I'll just talk. Professor? Yes. Um, I'm doing on the Alex, which means knowledge check. Is that uh, related? Uh, are you doing what's called the are you doing the initial knowledge yes check? yes so yeah you're gonna have to do that first before yeah. they let you do the the objectives the homework so do that this, first. do that first this, this is uh, related to our grade which we no, got it does not affect your grade here's what it does it determines what you already know and what you don't know okay and so what happens is if you if you know it, it's gonna say, hey, you know it, so you don't have to do this. Okay. So what happens is at the end of the initial knowledge check, it's kind of cool. You'll have what's called a pie. They call it pie progress. And they break it up into little components. Looks like a looks like the little ball that you put the Pokemon in. And then it has little slivers in the pot. When you take that, that initial knowledge check, let's say you took Chem 100 last week and you really did very well in it. You still know a lot of stuff, right? So all the stuff from chapter three, you probably already know it. So when you do the initial knowledge check, you'll get it right. So what it'll do is it'll say, hey, you already knew this, and you already knew that, and you already knew most of this. You just didn't know this part out here. And then it turns out, you know, you actually took physics in high school or physics at City Tech, and you knew a little bit about electricity and magnetism, and you knew a little bit about gases and stuff like that. So it might actually say, hey, look, based on that initial knowledge check, you knew a couple of these things. You already know these going into the course. Okay. So then what it'll do is it'll say, hey, overall, you know about 18% of the course already. That 18%, it's not going to have you do homework problems in that. It's only going to have you work on the 82%. So when after you finish this knowledge check it'll give you a report the initial knowledge check it'll give you a report and then it will say okay let's get to work start my path once you start your path it's just going to work on these it's not going to work on those okay okay thank you so much now, if you're someone that really likes to do a lot of work and really you like, I'm kind of like this too. Like sometimes I like, I just want to do everything because I want to refresh. I want to make sure I don't miss anything. What you can do in the initial knowledge check is you can say, I don't know. Every time you do a problem, you can say, I don't know. And if you do that for everyone in the initial knowledge check, this will come out as 0%. And this will come out as 100%. And then it'll just start have you working on everything, you know, the, the early stuff as well. Okay. So you're, you're free to do that. If you want. I don't recommend doing that because it creates more problems for you to do. I would recommend just do an honest work, you know, like, yeah, I, I do know how to do that. So here's what I think it is. It's going to have you do 30 questions. And I would recommend don't take an hour and a half to do those 30 questions. And please don't Google them. Don't try to look them up because I've had students do that and it's a disaster. What happens is they'll get the right answers and then what Alex will do is it will move them directly into the harder, more advanced problems, but they really don't know the earlier stuff. And so then they're just completely lost. And then you have to call Alex and have them reset the whole thing. So, so just be honest. Like if you really do think you know how to do it, do it, put in your answer, take 45 minutes, do your initial knowledge check and then start working on the pie. Okay. For most of you, it's going to have you work on chapter three first. And um, for some of, but you know, in that chapter three, there may be a few you really do know how to do. So out of those 24 topics, 
you already know how to do four. It's just, you're just gonna have to do 20 topics and that'll save you some time. It's really nice to save a little bit of time. Cause remember you gotta do, you gotta do the um, objectives. You gotta do the little lab reports. For those of you that are in section B, you gotta come on court, you know, you gotta come on campus and, and do the labs there. That takes some time right there. Um, and then you gotta take your weekly test. There's a test every week, right? And so, you know, you, 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 and many of you I know, I know many of you are taking other courses too. So, um, you know, you wanna save yourself time when you can. So with that pie progress, the initial knowledge checks the key to that. Kind of be honest about it. But if you know how to do something, you know, put in the right answer so that you don't have to do it in the pie. It's already done for you, okay? Thank you. Thank you for asking. And um, you may find that there's progressive knowledge checks later on, like in a couple of weeks, you're gonna have to do another knowledge check. And what it's gonna do is gonna say, oh, do you still know how to do this? Oh, you, you forgot how to do this. So we're gonna make you learn it again, okay? You'll still get credit on your homework for doing it the first time, but it's gonna kind of lock you into doing it again. So, so make sure you learn this stuff as you do them. Um, if you do a calculation, I think the course has 108 topics that you have to learn. And it looks to me like you've got 30, 60, 67 days. So that comes out to about 1.55 topics per day. Um, but you gotta do, you gotta get it right three times, right? So it's really 1.5, but you gotta get it right three times. So that's really 4.5 problems per day, but that's assuming you do it every day, right? And, you know, most likely there'll be a day or two where you just need a break and you're not going to be doing them. And then you got to take your exams too. Okay. The exams are actually pretty easy. Um, they're short. They're only 10 questions. Um, and they're not harder than the problems you're doing in the homework. So they're actually pretty good. Um, it, the main thing is do these homework assignments, do these objectives, get these, get these objectives done. That's your grade. Okay. Let me delete that. There we go. Okay, so let's try a one with interfering. So I'm gonna pick one here. This one looks pretty uh, challenging. So these are balancing. Oh, let me just check. Sometimes people put stuff on the chat and I often forget. Okay, let me just move this chat over here. There it is. Okay, I got the chat done. Okay. Um, so balancing chemical equations with interfering coefficients. What that means is that when you balance one substance, it affects more than one element. So like if in water, if you put a two in front of water, H2O, that doesn't just change hydrogen, it also changes oxygen. So there's a sort of interference that takes place there, two signals. So that, that's essentially what they're saying here, okay? So balance the chemical equation, small as possible whole number. By the way, in Alex, you gotta have whole numbers. You can't put fractions in at the end. The final answer has to have whole numbers. Um, oh, thank you, okay. So this one's a long enough equation, I won't put the states of matter. 10.04, okay. SiO2. And so there's three reactants here. There's a lot of reactants here. And then there's three products. So this one's a challenging one. Okay, so what I'm going to do just to kind of, I'm going to try to be a little organized here. I'm not a great at organization, but let's, let's identify the elements in here. You got calcium, there's a phosphorus, and then you got an oxygen, and then you got a silicon, right? And there's the carbon. Okay, so you got five elements here. Okay, so I'm going to do it and you know, you don't have to do this, but I'm just going to do an initial counting just to practice that a little bit. You got three here. So there's three calciums. You got a phosphorus, but then there's a two there. So there's two, right? And then 
the oxygen is more complicated because you got four times two, so that's eight, plus another two, so that's 10. And then there's one silicon, and then there's one carbon. Okay, so that's on the left side. By the way, we call that the reactant side. Okay, again, think of it like a factory. All these things are going in and all these things are coming out. The arrow points to what's coming out, the finished product. Okay. So on the right side, you got one calcium, right? There's only one there. And then you got one silicon, so I'll fill that in. And then you got three oxygens plus another one, so that's four. Four phosphorus, oh my goodness. And then one carbon. So if you actually look at it, one, two of the elements are already balanced, right? These are already balanced. Okay, so there might be a way to just sort of ignore those and just work on the other elements. That might work, but it might not because it's the interfering part is what makes it kind of complicated, okay? So I'm gonna try this, okay? I'm gonna focus on the ones that are not balanced and we'll leave the ones that are balanced for the end and see if we somehow changed them by balancing the ones that are not balanced, not initially balanced, okay? So let's start with the calcium. There's three here. There's only one here, right? So put a three in front of it, right? Okay, so now we got three calciums. Calcium is balanced. So I'm gonna check this off. This is now a three and it's balanced, okay? However, look what that did to silicon and oxygen. It changed it. That's the interfering part. By changing one, you're changing the others, okay? So we've changed the silicon and the oxygen. So I'm gonna change those now. So now on the right side, the product side, we got three silicons. How many oxygens do we have? Well, we have three times three, right? Remember that coefficient refers to everything in that formula. So it affects all three of those. So you got three times three, that's nine plus another one, now you got 10. Now that's kind of cool. So we did mess up the silicon, but that actually fixed the oxygen, but that will probably get messed up again, but we'll, we'll, we did the calcium. So let's do the next thing. Let's do the phosphorus. So we have two phosphoruses here and we have four over there. So one thing we could do is we could put a two because two times two is four. That would give us four phosphoruses, okay? But look what that does now. That changes the calcium over here now. Now you got six calciums, okay? So this is getting kind of complicated, right? So we're gonna to have to be a little organized about how we do this. So here's what I'm gonna do. As you can see, it's a little bit more complicated. As a general rule of thumb, when they get complicated like this, what you wanna do is you want to separate out the elements that are all by themselves from the ones that are in mixtures, in compounds, not mixtures, but compounds. So if you look, phosphorus here is all by itself and carbon is all by itself. So you want to do these last. And the reason behind that is that if you leave them for last, you can balance them by changing the coefficient where they're all by themselves. And that doesn't affect everything else. See the problem we were having earlier? Change one, you change the others. So one thing's balanced, but then when you change the other element, it unbalances that first one. If you lead them for last, that can help because you can balance everything else and then balance the ones that are all by themselves. So you would be balancing this one and this one last, okay? So that generally means then you're going to balance the other three first. So first, you're going to do calcium, silicon, and oxygen, because those ones are not by themselves. Okay, they're always mixed in with, or, yeah, they're always mixed in with something else. Okay, so let me get rid of all the coefficients here. 
And let's do the calcium, the silicon, and the oxygen, okay? So calcium, like I said, three over here, that makes sense, okay? We don't wanna change the phosphorus or the carbon. So notice by doing the calcium first, that didn't change the phosphorus over here, okay? So that's cool. So now let's do the silicon. Silicon, we have one here and we have three over here. So I'm gonna put a three there, okay? So calcium and silicon. So calcium and silicon are done. Now let's try to do the oxygen, okay? Again, we're leaving phosphorus and carbon. The ones that are by themselves, leave them for last. So oxygen, well, you've got eight here, four times two. You got six here, three times two. So that's eight plus six is 14. Over here, you've got um, nine, three times three, right? Okay, and then you got one over here. Okay, so you, you don't have enough oxygen on the right side. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. You have a smaller number on the right side than you have on the left side. So we need more on the right side, right? So I'm gonna balance, you know, you can't do it here because we've already done the calcium and the silicon. So you gotta do it here, okay? So let's do the oxygen. So if you have nine here and we need a total of 14, right? We have more on the left side, so you want to have a total of 14. 14 minus 9 is 5, so we need 5 more oxygens. So that means we got to have 5 here, right? Right. 5 times 1 is 5, plus 9 is 14. So now you have 9 plus 5 equals 14, okay? So remember, the number here times the subscript is going to be the number you need there, okay? So now the oxygen's done. And then like I said, if you leave the phosphorus and carbon alone until the end, now you can deal with them individually, meaning see how this is right here all by itself, okay? So this is just gonna be a little tricky. Here's how we're gonna do it. Let's do the phosphorus. We have how many phosphorus over here? Two times one. So you got two phosphorus. Over here, we have four phosphorus. I'm gonna put an arrow here just so you see. Now, here's the trick with this. We're gonna change this coefficient to make them equal. So here's what I'm gonna do. Two phosphoruses, right, has gotta equal the coefficient times four phosphoruses, right? Remember the coefficient, this number that you put in the front times the subscript, that's the total number. That n times four, right? Why four? Because we have a four subscript. So whatever that coefficient is, that times the four has got to equal what you have on the left side. We don't want to change this number here because if you change the number of phosphoruses, the only way to do that is to change this number and that will change calcium and it will change oxygen. And then you just start all over. So we want to change the coefficient here, n, okay? Well, now it's easy. If we divide both sides by four, you just get n. So what is it? It's two-fourths. What is two-fourths? It's a half. Two-fourths is a half. So the coefficient is a half. So really what we want to do here is we want to put a half. And now the phosphorus is balanced, okay? But what about the carbon? Is the carbon balanced? No. We have five carbons over here and we only have one over there. So what do we do? We put a five in front of it, okay? And this is now a balanced equation. It is a balanced equation that Alex will not accept, but it is a balanced equation, okay? Why won't Alex accept it? It won't because it tells you, you need whole coefficients. And remember, whole numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, not 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, blah, blah, blah. You got to have whole numbers. 
we have a fraction here. That is a real number. It is a rational number, but it is not a whole number. It's got to be one, two, zero, one, two, three, four. Okay. So how do we deal with that? If you have a half and you want to make it a whole number, you multiply by the smallest whole number you can. So if I have a half, if I multiply it by two, I get a whole number, right? So if the, if the coefficient had been a third, you multiply it by three and that'll give you a whole number. If it had been a fourth, you multiply that by four and that'll give you a whole number, okay? So since we have a half, we have to multiply it by two. But you can't multiply the coefficient of one and not the others, okay? The reason for that is that if, if I multiply this by two, I'm doubling the amount. If I'm doubling the amount here, I have to double the amount here. So instead of just multiplying that one by half, you multiply everything by half. I'm sorry, by two. Multiply everything by two, okay? So let me go through the last step. I'm going to actually no, it's right here. So I'm just going to write it. So we, we just we discovered that n was a half. So we have a half here. So we got to multiply by two. So multiplying by two, you get two of the calcium phosphates. All right. So I just put a two. Two times one is two. This is a three. So three times two is six. This is a five, so five times two is 10. Okay, I'm running out of room here. Multiply by two, you get six CaSiO3. A half times two is one, so you just get P4. Remember, if it's a one, no, you don't write anything. And then two would be 10. So by multiplying everything by two, that keeps it balanced, right? So think about it this way, if you, if you, if you make a cake and it's two cups of flour, one cup of sugar. If you want to make two cakes, you do four cups of flour and two cups of sugar. You multiply everything by two, right? Same thing here. If we're going to multiply this by two to get rid of the fraction, we multiply everything by two, okay? That way it's still balanced, and there you go, okay? Let me show you one more. There's about 12 minutes left. That one took me a while to get through because it was pretty complicated, but let's look at another one. This one's a little easier, but it's the same idea. Okay. So again, same idea. Notice how carbon and hydrogen are together, hydrogen and oxygen are together carbon and oxygen, this is just the reality of nature. Things combine in these ways, right? That's a chemical reaction. So this is combustion actually. So again, the one that's by itself, do that last, right? Oxygen is the only one by itself, okay? And, and then you can just go ahead and start on the left side. So let's identify the ones you do first. Carbon, hydrogen, that's it, right? There's only three elements in this one. The other one had five. This one only has three, so it's easier. So it's carbon and hydrogen. Now, technically speaking, it doesn't matter whether you do carbon first or hydrogen first. You could do either one. You'll get the same answer. Um, typically, if I see carbon and hydrogen, I do carbon and then hydrogen. But you could, you can do hydrogen first but do the oxygen last, okay? If you get a fraction to balance it, if you get a half, multiply everything by two, okay? So let's start with carbon. We got one carbon on the left, right? It's just one. And you got one on the right. So it's done, carbon is done, check. Hydrogen, four, two. So, you know, let's do the arithmetic here. On the left side, we have four. We want them to be equal. So whatever that coefficient is, I'll put it as an N. 
They got to be equal to each other, right? That's the logic we're using. It's, a, it's This is really arithmetic, right? You have four on the left side. You got to have four on the right. So what does that coefficient got to be that if you multiply it by two, you're going to get four? That's really what we're saying. Something times two has to equal four because we can't change that, but we can change that. Okay. So well, what is it? You just divide both sides by two, right? So that tells us it's got to be a two. So now you put a two there. It's really just basic algebra. OK, now we've done hydrogen. That's done. Now we go back and do the one that I said to do last, oxygen. It's all by itself. So what do we have? On the right side, we have two here, right? Because this is a coefficient is one. So you got two oxygens. And then two times one, you got two. So you got four. Over here, you have a two. The left side is smaller, so multiply by two. Two times two is four. You want them to be the same. Again, actually, let me show you again, just sort of being more formal. Let's call this M. M times two, right? The coefficient times the subscript. It's got to be equal to one times two plus two times one. So M times two has got to equal four. So M would be four over half, four over two, so that's two. So that's why we got a two there. And now we're done, all three done. That one's easier, right? That's, e that's easier than the calcium. If you can do the calcium and silicone one, that's pretty good, because that's a tough one. There are ones that are actually harder than that. Like when you do, uh, uh, what is it? Not, tri not TNT, it's... Uh, Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin breaks up into like six different things. And so that was a really tricky one. But um, but this one's not too bad. Okay, there's eight minutes left. So let me do one more. Okay, this one's a little, you know, this one's a little, this one's interesting. Let's try it. F E. I have enough room here, so I'll put the states of matter in. So three reactants, so that's kind of tricky. Just getting a little bit low on battery. But I think we got enough time. Okay, there we go. All right, so we got three elements, F, E, O, and H. Now, one of the elements is all by itself, so do that last. So do these ones first. Do the iron and the hydrogen first, okay? Let's do iron first. Iron's easy, right? Because there's only one here, and there's only one there, so iron is done. Okay, we can check that one off right there. Now we got to do the hydrogen. There's two over here. There's only two over there, right? That's two. Two times one. Remember, the number inside the parentheses times the number outside the parentheses. And then if there's a coefficient, it would be all three, right? You would take your coefficient in the front times the number, the subscript in here, times the subscript out there. So it'd be n times subscript times subscript. OK, so it looks like hydrogen's already done, two and two. Now we just got oxygen. Now here's the trick. Let's do oxygen. Remember how we left this for last? So I'm going to put a subscript. I mean, I'm going to put a, a coefficient there, n. There's a 2, right? So n times the 2. So that 2 right there is that one. And this n is right there. And then you got a 1 there. So you got to add that. The total on the left side has got to equal the total on the right side. So there's a 1 times a 2. Okay, so let's, let's clean this up. 2n plus 1 equals 2, right? Subtract 1 from both sides. 2n equals 1. Divide both sides by, by 2. 1 half, right? So n is a half. We talked about that with the first one. That's a half. Okay, 
That, I'm going to be honest with you, that's a perfectly fine balanced equation, and most chemists would accept that as a balanced equation. It's only when you're taking general chemistry that people will say you can't leave it like that. You got to have whole numbers, right? Chemists actually use fractions all the time, but when they teach it in general chemistry, they make you have whole numbers, but that's okay. We should be able to figure out how to get a whole number out of a fraction. Um, so let's do that here. We got one more step. We want to turn that fraction into a whole number, a half. So again, you multiply, you could multiply it by any even number. Actually, you could multiply it even by any odd number. No, I wouldn't. You have to multiply it by an even number, right? Half, the two is an even number. So you got to multiply an even number by an even number to get a whole number, the fraction. So um, you could multiply by four, six, eight, ten, 10, but that would just give you big numbers. We want the smallest whole number. Okay, so the smallest whole number, you get that by multiplying it by two. That's how you get the smallest whole number. So multiply everything by two. So if you multiply a one by two, you get a two. If you multiply a half by two, you get a one. Remember, if it's a one, you don't put the number. Multiply one by two, you get two. Multiply one by two, you get a two. And that ensures that it's still balanced. Everything is still balanced if you multiply everything by the same number, but it gets rid of the fraction. That's the trick here, right? Or no, it's the, the key point. If you have a fraction, you got to multiply it by something to get rid of the fraction, but you have to multiply everything by that same number, okay? I don't think Alex gives you ones where you're going to get a third or a fourth or a fifth. There are ones where there, that does exist. I haven't seen, they usually give you a half. And so um, if you do if you do see one in Alex where they give you a, you, know, you got to multiply by three, so you get a third or a fourth, let me know. Take a screenshot of it and send it to me because I want to see it. Um, but I haven't seen them come up yet. They're, they're, it's, it's either going to be all whole numbers or you're going to get a half somewhere. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to do one more, but I'm going to do real fast. So if you, um, oops. So if you want, if you, if you have trouble keeping up with this one, just uh, replay it and do it um, in slow motion. I just want to make sure I don't do it so fast I get it wrong. Right, that's the important point. Again, there's not enough room here, so I'm going to leave the states of matter out. I'm going to put a little bit of room there, just so I can put a new coefficient in. CO2. So this is combustion. This is actually, this shouldn't be too hard. They're just showing you the first substance, which is no name. This is N no name or straight chain no name um, being combusted with oxygen to form carbon dioxide water. So it's not that hard. It's just a matter of how do you count the carbons and the hydrogens. I'm going to condense it down easier. If you count up all the carbons, you get nine. If you count up all the hydrogens, you get 14 plus six, which is 20. Now it's suddenly a little easier to do. This one I don't think needs a fraction. If it needs a fraction, then I have to think a little bit about why I didn't see that. Okay, so again, do the oxygen last because it's all by itself. So just do the carbon and the hydrogen first. You got nine carbons, so we need nine here. Right, nine carbon dioxides gives you nine carbons. That's actually what happens in an automobile engine, a, a car engine. In the gasoline, there's actually this substance in some small percentage that exists in the gasoline. The oxygen is pumped in through the air is pumped in, which brings in oxygen. Oxygen reacts with the nonane and it blows up essentially and gives you carbon dioxide and water and energy. It produces heat, and the heat is what drives the piston. Okay. Okay, so we got, um, why did I put an O there? That was weird. Oh, H20, that's what I, I'm sorry, I said 20. I, I, thought that I, I thought I put C9H2O, it was C9H20. Okay, so carbon's done, now we do hydrogen. We got 20 on the left, we only got two on the right, so put 10, right? 10 times two is 20, okay? Hydrogen's done, now we just got oxygen. Okay. There's more on the right side, right? When you do the combustion, there'll be more on the right side. So you got 18 oxygen here, 9 times 2, 10 times 1, 
28. I'm going to put an M there. There is no oxygen in the first substance. It's only here. So N times 2 equals 28, All right? So N equals 28 over 2. That's a whole number. If you get a whole number, you don't have to multiply everything by 2 because you got it right there, OK? Now you got a balanced equation. So that one I did in two and a half minutes. That one's pretty good, OK? Um, so, you know, I was actually thinking about the Alex. If the first one on this particular topic, if the first one you get is really hard and you're just you're looking at it and you can't figure out how to get it right, you might want to say, try another, show another first, and then see if the next one's a little easier. Okay. But once you've done gotten one right, don't do that. If you've gotten one right, because you got to get three in a row. So if you get one right, you don't want to like get the next one, like show another, because that means you got it wrong, which means you got to do it again three more times. So, but if it's the first one that comes up um, and it looks too hard, you could do that. So that one was silicon and phosphorus. That was a pretty tough one. The other ones are pretty easy. So if you get one like this, it comes up, do this one first. Okay. So I'm going to upload this. I always upload the videos unless there's some kind of weird technical problem. Um, I upload it to YouTube and um, and then I'll make an announcement. You know, I'll create an announcement in Blackboard that shows the link to it. But I'm going to put them all in the same folder, that folder where I put the description of the syllabus, the description of Alex videos. There's two Alex video problems there it's on YouTube I'm talking about. So every day there'll be another video of the lecture, right? Tuesday, there's no lecture because those of you that are in section B for the lab, we're going to be meeting on campus, right? So, so you know, no lecture tomorrow on Tuesday, but Wednesday we'll have the next lecture. And um, since I did balancing chemical equations, I guess on Wednesday we'll cover the mole and molar mass, which is section 3.4. We'll do combustion analysis, which is 3.5. Then on Thursday, we'll do 3.6 and 3.7, which is balanced equations and limiting reactants. And again, if you want to get ahead, like, you know, like, look, I, I, I want to do these, those problems tonight. Again, you can go back to my spring 2021 course on YouTube and watch those videos for a little bit of insight, right? You're self-pacing the homework, but there are due dates. You got to get them done by the due dates, okay? All right, so again, um, three, four, seven, two, four, nine. This is on the syllabus, but I'll write it down again. You know, you got WhatsApp, you got um, Signal, you got Telegram, you can text. Just get in touch with me if you have questions, okay? All right, have a great day, guys. And for those of you in the lab, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, for those of you that are doing the online lab, section A, I will see you on Wednesday for the next lecture. Take care.